We cannot overemphasize that uh, the success of every country depends on business and economics. So we uh, we're going to be discussing current economic issues and top on that will be the appointment of the new central bank governor. Our panel will be looking into that. We'll also be discussing the involvement of the International Monetary Fund or IMF into Liberia. Most of the time we hear what IMF said, what IMF did. We want to examine that invo their involvement into Liberia. We also want to overall discuss the financial state of the country. Money, the MOKO drives everything. How are we doing? Please share the video, invite somebody and let's discuss economics. There are a lot of uh, shows on the internet. Here, every Saturday at 3 p.m., we concentrate strictly on business and economic. That one, that our area. We'll be opening our phone lines very, very quickly from the beginning of the show so that we all can participate into discussing business and economics. What do you think of the appointment of the new Central Bank of Liberia governor? Okay, there's a lot of buzz about his appointment at this time in our economy. We want to also look at the involvement of the International Monetary Fund. Are they helping us? Are they hurting us? Who are these people that are advising us? Economic, that our area, the Alex June area, Jepu Zuo, that area. Some people area that to cross on the internet, some people area that politics, some people area to spill the G's and the fry. Every Saturday at 3 p.m., our area, business and economics. Mr. Alex Jones, we want to welcome you to the Business and Economic Forum. Again, viewers, my name is Dennis Jai, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Jones, welcome. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but you are low. Pump up the okay. volume. We are here All to right. discuss business and economics. OK, can you hear me? All right. All right. Everybody got your area. This is my area. I am not afraid to show it. Mr. Jones, we're going to be discussing some current economic issues in Liberia. Top of that is the appointment of the new or central bank governor. We're going to be looking at the involvement of, of the IMF in Liberia. IMF is the International Monetary Fund. And we'll be discussing the overall state of the financial state of the country. If time permits, I want us to look at other financial institutions because anytime we think about our financial institution, we think of uh, the central bank, we think of uh, the uh, finance ministry and stuff like that. But there are others that we're going to be, we can look at when time permits. So let me pass it on to you to uh, first uh, reintroduce yourself to our guests and uh, let's begin the discussion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jai. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here on another beautiful Saturday uh, in Clearwater, uh, Florida, uh, which is close to Tampa. Uh, my name again is Alex Chuchu Jones. Uh, uh, I am a financial analyst. Uh, and I would say, you know, a uh, writer of finance or a student of finance and economics. Um, and I currently consult uh, banking institutions and financial institutions, which I've done for, I would say, the last 10 to 15 years, all, all my business career or professional career. Uh, took an interest in African economies a few years ago and started to research and write about 
the state of uh, African economies, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, started to investigate, you know, why poverty and why the economy is so uh, underperformed. And then, of course, my own country, Liberia, I started to review some of the decisions that were made economically in the past, in the 70s, the 80s, and up to current. So basically, you know, that's just a short in introduction of myself. And as you go along, hopefully, you know, you get to know more about me. Uh, one of the, uh, I would say, creator of the Business and Economic Forum that is there to discuss uh, business and economics uh, on a weekly basis on focus on Liberia. And thank you for joining. And hopefully, we'll have a wonderful discussion today. All right, uh, Mr. Jones, we've been doing uh, the Business and Economic Forum for some time now. And uh, this is uh, something that you came up with and decided to partner with uh, Focus on Liberia so that we can discuss economic issues. Before we even begin our discussion today, I want us to uh, go back, you know, like uh, the way we started a few months ago and just talk about the significance of discussing these issues. You've, uh, you've uh, been following Liberian talk shows and uh, you too, you've written extensively about Liberian economic issues. But this time, uh, we are doing it on TV, Focus on Liberia. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose? What do you intend to uh, realize? And what has been the impact of what we are doing right here? What's the feedback that you are getting from people, both Liberians and outside and uh, non-Liberians? Well, I, I'm amazed, you know, that uh, so many people, uh, so many Liberians, uh, have taken an interest in such a program. Usually when you talk business or economics, uh, it's a topic that, you know, not many people are interested in and for good reason, because it's dry. Uh, they, it doesn't really uh, uh, relates to the day-to-day -day life of people or the realities. So when you talk about things like uh, 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 GDP, no one already knows or understands, or at least not many people, what it means and how you affect them, you know, in terms of their jobs, in terms of their savings. Uh, so what I wanted to do was, you know, because I studied business economics in my grad school and dissertation was in business economics. So it's basically what that means is uh, you have, of course, the political economics, you have uh, econometrics, which does deal with the numbers and trying to put economic terms into equations, but well, business economics is like your regular businesses, uh, how, when they make a product like Apple, uh, what, why they would make the product that size or set it for a particular price. So why is the iPhone $800 and not 900 or not 400? So that's a, you know, that kind of real, you know, uh, real world uh, application is basically where my era specialty, speciality is in. And then as an analyst, you know, looking at numbers, uh, when your company lay you or why, when you uh, apply for a job, for instance, I applied for some jobs where I knew I was very qualified and I should have gotten a job and I didn't get a job. And it was not because of my own qualification, but the company felt they could hire someone with perhaps less experience, maybe someone who just graduated and they would pay them 30% less. So that's business economics. They're looking at it from, how does this affect us uh, from an income standpoint uh, rather than the experience? They're like, we can train this college graduate, you know, in two to three years, pay them significantly less than bringing someone who already has the experience and the, the, you know, the, the, the experience over the years. So the show has been great to answer your question um, because I didn't participate. I will have hundreds of people viewing the the, the YouTube or even, you know, dozens of people coming on live. I didn't expect that the panelists would grow from just uh, me and Dr. Gumpu, uh, who we first started the show, into now a large panelists of people from different backgrounds, investment, real estate, or uh, Liberian economists. Uh, a recent a, a gentleman, Leonard Liberian, who will be joining us, uh, he's a stockbroker. So it's, it's brought together the network of Liberians who are in this area for the first time, I would say, in Liberian history in the diaspora, where 
I can pick up the phone today and call a number of people and ask them questions uh, about Liberia like, economy or who, for instance, the central bank uh, governor is, uh, our new central bank governor, and I, I would get a great response. Before, I was just working in a silo, you know, in silo. I didn't know many uh, Liberians who have specialities in this area today. My, you know, network has grown. You, 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 you stress something which I think is very important, that is uh, the business and economic decisions. The business and economic background that drives some of these decisions. Say you, you gave an example of a company not being able to hire you because they look at, okay, if we can get someone who is less experienced and uh, with less education, we can pay them maybe 30 or 40% less. So the same thing should happen to a country. Oh, absolutely. A, a country. So what are basically. some of things a country will look at that would drive their decision being it uh, where they need to put their money, where they need to, you know, wish or areas they need to invest in, even people that are sent to school. Okay. okay. Good question. Very good question. And a particular area, for instance, where I think Liberia, Liberia a country has done a poor job, okay, uh, in our country, like foreign scholarship, okay? So we get these scholarships from different countries. That for instance, India will give us scholarship for 10 people, America will give a scholarship, UC scholarship, all of that, right? As eight. Okay, and we send these people abroad. They go, they come to America, and they get good education. They go to the best schools. Uh, that is hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, that the government has invested into these people. Then what usually happens? Uh, some of them never return. Uh, so that money is just basically expense. There's no actual return. There are many people today who benefit from government scholarships that never worked for the Liberian government or not long enough. Furthermore, the same thing can, can be said to universities. So because we depend so heavily on foreign scholarships and education, uh, our university have suffered as a consequence. So the, if, if we were to say, for instance, China came and said, look, we gave you 20 scholarships uh, uh, to, for your people. Tell the Chinese government, look, we have a wonderful university here. Why didn't you send five Profession, uh, professors to teach there. That way they can perhaps teach 200 people every quarter. So as you see the trade-offs, you know, one will be building our own internal uh, capacity. Two will be benefiting, a lot more people will benefit, right? Then sending five people who may or may not come back or may or may not contribute. So that, that's economics. That's, uh, you know, uh, the trade-offs in economics. You know, uh, you, you know, what, what, what are you leaving for you but, know, your, what your options Alex, are? Yes. Why are people not looking at the, uh, these kind of business and economic uh, theories or ideas to come up with this decision? They don't know or this is deliberate? Well, you see, uh, it, it's twofold. One, the people who are, who are managing our economy, that, and, and I think today's show will talk about some of them. They're, some of them are very brilliant people, uh, but they're in the wrong place. I, I saw a cartoon, I think, on, 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 on uh, one of the uh, social media where a guy is sitting on, a, in, in, in a, on an island and he has a stump or a tree. And he could have used the tree to get off the island, but instead he turned the tree into a chair. So that's what happens in these, one of these countries, including Liberia, where you have very good people, but they're in the wrong area. Now, why corporations, again, do very well? Because corporations spend a big amount of time, a huge amount of time, on not just finding the right people, but making sure that person is in the right place. So, okay, for instance, I mean, I hear a lot of people, oh, you should be finance minister, oh, you should be, deb you know, you work in the government. How do you know I'm the right person to be finance minister? because I talk about economics. Economics is broad, finance is broad. There are people who just focus in investment. That's all they do their entire life. Uh, there are people who focus in uh, treasury, which is just another whole area of economics and finance. There are people who focus in mortgage, mortgage banking, investment banking, uh, global banking. So most of the people who are working in government, I can say this with, you know, on a, as a fact, they, number one, they're not in the suitable, in the right capacity, the right place. 
Let's give example our finance minister, current finance minister, this is Samuel Tua. I wrote an article about Samuel Tua. I checked his credential. I, I, I did my own homework. He's a smart guy. But does that mean that the Ministry of Finance is the right place for him to be? Why not Congress? Why not State Minister of State? Why, you know, so again, that's the question. Do we have the right people in the right place? Because when you don't have the right people in the right place, then you make those kind of decisions because they're making decisions based on impulse as opposed to being objective or on solid economic and business uh, concept. Hmm. So, so one of those people that we're going to talk about today is the new, uh, the new appoint, the, uh, appointee to the Central Bank of Liberia, Mr. J. Aloysius Jalu. So we started with a song, say, that your area. So I, I want us to look at uh, this, of this fellow Liberian who was who was appointed, and see that that that's him, right? Right, right. That's uh J. Alashas Talu. Uh -huh. What's your first the your first thing that came to your mind when you heard of this appointment? Because we've been discussing the central bank for some time now. We talked about it at length about uh, its role and how almost everything that we discussed. Or uh, hinged on the Central Bank of Liberia. So, when you heard of, of his appointment, what was your first uh, uh, thought? I think I've met the man. You know, the, on the last show, I said uh, I didn't, but now when I look at his picture, uh, because I live in New York City for some of my you know, finance life and a and, 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 you know, short while in New Jersey. And so, I think we've, we may have met before. Uh, having said that, uh, my first impression of any appointment, uh, you know, it's not that the person isn't qualified. Again, like I said earlier, the person may be very qualified. Let's just look at somebody like Einstein, right? There's no question Einstein is a genius, right? But Einstein is a genius only in physics. He's not a genius in chemistry or biology or banking. You're not going to take Einstein and make him the head of J.P. Morgan, okay? Or Isaac Newton, you know? So again, my first thing when I see a position is, uh, or when I hear an appointment, whether it's president or it's vice president or it's you know, a minister, is um, what is this person? I look for articles the person has written. As a professional you know, any, in, in academia, the way in which uh, you distinguish yourself is by the papers you write. That's the standard. So for instance, let me give you a guy named uh, Joseph Stigler. Joseph Stigler was uh, Bill Clinton, head of the Economic Council, and he worked at the World Bank. He was the chief economist for the World Bank. He wrote many books, one, uh, Globalization and Its Discontent, bestseller. If you, if you have you read that book, it's like the Bible, one of the Bible in modern economics uh, today. Uh, and he was very disappointed in that book. He talked about how uh, many of the World Bank uh, uh, staff how unqualified they were to go to a country for two days or a week and set the whole policy on that country when they never lived there. When these, these are just kids, some of them just graduated with one year degree from Georgetown or somewhere and they become analysts for a country. And they are the ones setting the uh, destiny of that whole entire country. So he, li he literally criticized the, uh, the, the inefficiency and the unqualification of many of the staff of the World Bank, hmm. okay? And you can read that book, again, it's called uh, Globalization and It's Discontent. Maybe you can Google it and put it on the screen for those who want to read. Uh, so again, when I read, when I, when I heard about Mr. Talu, I know you pronounce it Talu, or I, I don't know the librarian, but it's T-A-T-A-R-L-U-E. Mr. Yeah, Talu, okay, Talu. so Talu, okay. So uh, the first thing I would do is I would Google the person and see, what have they written? Because uh, that would tell me a lot how they're thinking. Mm -hmm. Meaning, what are, you, what, what are the plans? That you shouldn't take a job and then before people get to understand you know, where this person view on, on monetary policy or on uh, you know, fiscal policy. Well, uh, the first thing we look at earlier here is the person qualification. And we, we, we see that uh, he, he, holds a, he, he has a graduate degree. Okay, and then he has worked in uh, several banks, mainly in uh, the compliance. Okay. 
Okay. So I don't even I don't even look at that. Okay. I don't even look at that. Okay. So I don't even look at a person degree because many of the people today who are the greatest people don't have a bachelor's degree. So many Liberians who are so fascinated by degrees, and that's why they get people who does not perform. So degrees to me means absolutely I would not nothing but very minimal when it comes to capabilities. Again, you don't have to have a master's degree to understand finance or economics. You do not have to have a master's degree to understand engineering or, or even know how to code. Okay? Uh, you can learn that. And more, many of the greatest people, including in economics, for instance, uh, Adam Smith was not an economist. <laughs> that, he's the father of economics, modern economics theory. But, you know, he was I think, a philosopher or something. And all he did was he just studied the economic activities during his time. And he was able to come up with the capitalist model. Okay, uh, so again, I don't look at a person's degree because if you judge a person by the degree, you make a lot of mistake. Mm. Oh, what, what's for the experience? They're not they're okay. So what, what, the first thing I would look at a publication. If it's if it's a job that has to do with intellectual ability or a job that has to do with you know uh, you know that has to do with uh, anything academic, like if the person is going to be, uh, let's say, minister of state. Okay, the good example. Let's say just uh, uh, Dennis Ja was appointed the new minister of state of Liberia, right? Yeah. And let's say I just go and look at Dennis Ja credential and say, okay, maybe he has a master's degree in health technology, right? Yeah. I wouldn't know. That's not saying a lot about you. That not, that's not saying you never read it. Even maybe perhaps you work in health technology, or maybe, but most of your interests have been what Liberian history, Liberian culture. You're reading books. Or at least a book, I think, or two. You have created a, a, a media. You know just about every Liberian, uh, everything about Liberian, most of Liberian culture, most of Liberian, uh, you know, way of living. So I will, if I just look at your degree, rather than going online and seeing where all you've done and where your area is, then I would dismiss you as a minister of still Liberia because I would say, what does this man know about? Liberian culture, a state minister is someone who's supposed to know everything about how the people interact, the different tribes, the different, you know, uh, different social groups, the different, you know, um, you know the, from the indigenous people to the American Liberia. Again, so that's just to tell you where I'm thinking, but I don't think like the normal guy because the job that I do, right, I, I don't get paid to just look at things like everybody, I get people to look at things a particular way. So if you tell me it's Coca-Cola a good company, right? To the eyes of many Liberians, yeah, this is a great company. I would could tell you that this is one of the worst companies in the Fortune 500. Why? Because I'm not looking at just a brand. I'm going to look at okay, the past five years. How how what's the growth rate? Okay, what's the return on capital? Okay, well, how many new markets? Compare Coca-Cola now with Uber or Google or Facebook. So you see, that's how a professional person should look at. A if you go to a doctor, the doctor is not just going to look at you and say you're healthy. The doctor is going to first tell you, hey, you need to do these tests, right? And the doctor would look at the test result, and that's how the doctor will be able to prescribe medication. So, OK, let, let me read something on, on Talu. Talu holds a master in public administration from Kenya University uh, and has worked 17 years in quality compliance, enforcing standards in the range of global financial institutions. He worked for JP Morgan Chase from March 2013 to 2018 as compliance officer in quality control. You, you're saying that tells you nothing when it comes to who he is. Yeah. So, so now, what, what within this time, at the point where we have the central bank, what are you expecting from Mr. Talu to do? Well, first of all, um, the central bank is the most uh, important uh, institution in the modern economy. Okay. And I'll pause there to say that again. The most significant institution in terms of human development is the central bank of countries. They determine everything from you know the prices, uh, the uh, to 
uh, cash inflow to investments to uh, inflation, you know, uh, stimulus and all those things. Prices, I thought prices was commerce. Uh, they, they, it's price stability. So the, the currency is what determines how much currency is what determines the movement of prices. Okay. So price stability is the job of the central bank uh, government. That's one of the, one, in fact, that's the me. One of them, if you look at the central bank's website, even the US Federal Reserve, price stability is their main, one of the main focus and low empl empl and, and, and employment. So employment is one, price stability is the other one. And that has to do with the money supply. So again, um, they have that big responsibility. That's not a job that somebody can go on to and learn. That means you're looking for someone who has spent most of their career studying these things, most of the, understanding it, understanding employment in a country, what makes a country go, growth and employment. Uh, someone who um, I would look at as an authority on setting policy. Now, if, if you are in, so every bank, for instance, because I work in the banking industry, and all these banks I worked at myself, JP Morgan, Mellon, I didn't work for Deutsche Bank or, or Mary Lynch, but I worked for JP Morgan and uh, Mellon. I consulted them. Worked for JP Morgan, consulted at Mellon two years ago. Um, so every bank has a chief economist. And the chief economist is the person who actually looks at the current economic conditions, the growth of the nation or the market, and advise right, the management team on, you know, Growth is going to be slow next year, so maybe we need to lay people off or we need to cut back on some of our expense. That's what the economists at a bank will do. Uh, among other things, things like determining where the product pricing and things like that. Uh, so this should be somebody who understands that theory, employment, pricing, and so forth. And from what I see from the resume, again, I can't judge a person just by the resume. First, I'll judge this man by his uh, publication, but I, I I don't think he's written any publication that uh, is, is it, that's out there for me to say, okay, what's his view on inflation in Liberia? What's his view on on the growth in Liberia? What's his view on you know how how do we uh, the government expense the IMF? You know those kinds of things. I don't know his views. He hasn't published his views. He hasn't done any interview. He has not called the business economic forum to say, hey, yeah, my views on X, Y, Z. But the next thing one morning we wake up and we say this guy now is supposed to be the expert in central bank policy. So um, that's how most of our people are placed. Uh, and it's, and it, it's a problem. And that's what we get the result that we get sometimes. Because we just look at this person have a master's degree or they work at J.P. Morgan. Look, janitors work at J.P. Morgan. OK, um, not because you work at a bank or you work at any reputable institution, even at the White House. That means it's automatically a qualification or it, it just isn't. And to say this, you don't have to work at any of those places to understand economics, to understand librarian uh, financial condition and to be able to prescribe uh, methods to do it. You don't have to have a master's degree. You don't have to work for any bank. All you have to have is a sharp mind and you, someone who has been studying the, the issues, or someone who's made recommendations, mm -hmm. or who has proven over the years that they really understand, you know, the, mm -hmm. the current financial situation in our country. So, so with the exchange rate now, and also inflation, um, the discussion on the printing of new banknotes, we have a new central bank governor who's coming in, needs to be confirmed. Um, the Senate is on recess now, or and they're supposed to come back uh -huh. so on day one. So for the first 100 days of this central bank governor, what are some of the changes you will expect? Well, first, he, he has to uh, communicate to the public. That would be the first thing you, you do. And I have to take a quick break. Uh, if you don't, if you, if you allow me, just review, I just need to get my other charger. OK? OK, sure. Now ask a question. Give me a two minutes break. Yeah. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. This is the Business and Economic Forum. Today we are discussing some current economic issues in Liberia. 
And number one on the agenda is the appointment of the new govern of the new central bank governor. That's uh, Mr. J. Alashos Talu. He's being appointed as the governor of the central bank. We also discuss, we'll be discussing the involvement of the International Monetary Fund in our business, in our affairs. Uh, most of these uh, international institutions, they, have, they advise us, they support us, and they do stuff. So we want to know exactly what their involvement is or what it should be, and what should we expect from them. Are they really helping? Are they hurting us? Or they are just keeping us just to remain afloat and not to thrive? We will overall discuss the financial state of the country, how we're doing financially. And if time permits, we're going to discuss other financial institutions like uh, the LRA, you know, uh, even LPROC and all those institutions. We'll, we'll talk about them briefly. And uh, if you want to join the discussion, we have our teleconference number. You can, you can call that. That is being posted on Facebook, 605. 313-6004. The code is 791403. There were some, uh, I think, some phones, or depending on your plan, when you call that number, they'll say you're going to be charged one cent per minute. And somebody heard that and he dropped the phone. And I was disappointed that uh, you cannot, even if you stay on the phone one hour, that will be 60 cents. Please, if you can, please. If you join the if you join the call and spend all that time, and you need for the business and economic forum to re refund you that 15 cent you spent for 15 minutes, we will do that. But the state of our economy is so important. The state of affairs of our country is so important that we should be able to afford 15 cents, 20 cents, or even 60 cents if you stay there for one hour to discuss business and economic. We are, most of the time we are excited to discuss politics and see who's doing what. That is good. But if the economy is not right, there is no politician or there is no political strategy that's going to get it right. So it is important. Please uh, join the call. The number again is being posted on Facebook. That is 605-313-6004. Code 7914-03. If you're being charged one cent per minute, yes, pay the one cent and join the call. Let me go back to Mr. Alex Jones as we discuss the new appointee or the, uh, of the Central Bank of Liberia. Okay, thank you again. Uh, uh, sorry for that little interruption break. I got some water and everything, so I'm good. All right, so the, again, um, a big part of um, running an agency like the Central Bank or any bank, right? The first thing is public relations, how you communicate the policy. So let me give you an example. Uh, four times a year, the US Central Bank governor speaks to the press at least four times. And that happens when they uh, set the interest rate. So they have these meetings. And again, the way the American uh, or the British Central Bank is set up, it's not how Liberian Central Bank are set up. Our Central Bank is one, very centralized, whereas in these other countries, they have a decentralized Central Bank. So in America, which is where we try to copy, in the, again, because I know a lot of people say, oh, we're not America. But everything we do is copy from America. We just didn't copy the right formula. We copied parts of it, and we left the rest. But ideally, what you, what you have is you have different districts Right? So in America, like 12 central bank, bank districts. And each of them have a central bank president. Okay? So they all get together about four times a year. And what they do, they discuss all of the economic activities, production, manufacturing growth, uh, trade, uh, you know, the, the currency movement. They discuss everything. They have these, meeting, these meetings in uh, Washington, D.C., where, where, where the central bank a chair we precise. And for two days, they discuss all these different recommendations, what are the raise interest rate or lower interest rate or keep interest rate at a constant. And then when they're done with the meeting, they, uh, they publish their result on what, it, what the decisions are. That's the biggest economic event in the world. Every 
bond trader or every bank or every uh, financial institution is waiting to see and to hear the decision from that, from that, from that meeting. Okay, they call it, it's called the Fed meeting. And when the, when the number, the numbers usually come out around two o'clock. So all the business news, everybody's watching. And they will come and say, okay, we will increase interest rate by 25 basic points, which is just 25 points, okay? Meaning if it's $1, 1%, 1%, 1 we'll we'll take it to 1, 1 and 25%, okay? And then you see all the stock market people moving and people like, okay, start going all 200 points coming down. What happened? People are trying to absorb that decision. How would it affect the customer? How would it affect their business, their contracts? You know, because it, it, everything is, is predicated on the interest rate. How much you can charge for a car, your credit card, your housing, okay? And then after that meeting, the chairman will come out and he will give a statement. And after the statement, an interview. Now, sometimes the market will go up 200 points, but then when the Fed chairman starts to talk, you see it coming down and then things will settle. What is he doing? He's communicating the decision. So you may be thinking that the increasing interest rate because of inflation, and he will tell you, no, we're not we're increasing interest rate because of growth. We're growing too fast. So that's a whole different, you know, that same interest rate increase, two different communication. One was you look at the number, the other one you listen to the Fed chairman. So again, you to answer your question, the first thing any minister, any central bank governor, any central bank member, the first thing you want to do is, in a situation, you want to be able to communicate effectively. One, let the people know you. Okay? Go on as many public media as possible. Put a written statement out. Letting them know what you, you know, preliminaries, what you intend to do or what your views are on certain things. That calms the market, that calms people, that tells people, okay, at least we know this guy, where he's, you know, some of his, you know, we're getting to know him, we don't know him. So until we can see that, you know, where he, you know, we can see his communications, communication skill, skills, you know, even if, he, if you have a good policy, if you can communicate it right, again, Samuel Tuev is another example. Not all the Samuel Tuev's policy are wrong. Let me be honest with you. I know librarians, you listen to Harry Castor, you listen to all these other people, you're like, okay, you know, he wants to increase, I mean, he, the IMF seeing this, or you, not all his policies are wrong. Some of them are accurate, some of them are good policies, but the way in which he communicates it, they're wrong. Because he does not give good information about why you're taking this decision. He does not show the data. He does not show any real trend. I think one time, If you're just joining us, once again, this is Focus on Liberia. This is our business and economic forum where we discuss nothing but economic and business. Today, we are discussing current economic issues in Liberia, starting with the appointment of the central bank governor. We're gonna go into the IMF shortly. And if you wanna be part of the discussion, please uh, give us a call. Let's uh, discuss this. It is very important that we uh, give your views. What's your impression? What you think of the new central bank governor? What you think of the involvement of IMF into our uh, business and economic? Even the World Bank, what you think of that? Also, uh, what you think of the uh, overall financial state of our economy? What are some of the things happening and how you think we can fix them? My guest, uh, uh, who is also an analyst on the show, is Mr. Alex Jones. Okay, I'm there. I'm back. Mr. Mr. Jones. Okay, I'm back. With with with, with all that, I, I don't, you know, you you may not be direct, but what I'm hearing is, uh, you don't have much faith in uh, the new central bank governor delivering. Is that what I'm picking up from you? Because okay. you have not seen his publication. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, okay, okay. People do not go out, right? Michael Jordan does not go out and become the world best basketball player one day because he just came to Chicago Bulls and then he started winning championships. Little right? volume, please. Yeah. Yeah. Is it better? Hello? Yeah. Okay. I said Michael Jordan 
did not just come on one day or Phil Jackson and they just appointed him to be the, the coach of the LA, the LA Lakers and then he became this great coach, right? Phil Jas Jackson has a path. He has train records, his college, his, you know, his views on certain decisions. So if you ask me to have faith, I don't believe in just having blind faith because somebody say they can do something. I never have any faith in anything or anybody unless I see it, unless there is evidence. I believe in math, I believe in science, I believe in the evidence. So I may like the person, I may think the person is a great person, but do, if you tell me, if this guy was running a bank where I take my money to go and put it in that bank or my investment, absolutely not. Because there's nothing for me to go on. So I don't just place my, you know, my views on, if somebody out there can convince me, call me and tell me why what should I think that Mr. Talu is a good central bank governor. Let's have a debate about it. Show me the record on where, where bank is run, where area, where are some of the record that you are basing your views about why this person would be the best person to run an economy that is, that is in shambles. Let's, let's go to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. A lot of our discussion or economic discussion have been based on what the IMF said. Tell me first the role of the IMF, especially when it comes to Liberia. What, what do they tell us what they're supposed to be doing? So the IMF is basically uh, the International Monetary Fund. And it's kind of like every country has a central bank, and every central bank is part of this club, okay? This club that is there to help that country in times of need. If you don't need, if you don't have any real dire need, then the IMF has nothing to do with your policy, how you run your economy. You can do whatever you want to do. But if you run into a problem where you start, you can't pay your, 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 your bills, so when somebody wants to buy something in Liberia, they have to use a different country's currency, right? If you want to buy a car and I draw rice. So your bank makes a goes to the IMF now and there's a transfer that occurs in terms of currency exchange, right? And when you when you don't have enough reserve to pay for that, that exchange of currency, then you have to borrow it from the IMF, okay? Where it's FDR and, and, and other instruments that they have that it can lend you temporarily so that the trade in the work can go on, you know, we all pick up. So that's the role of the IMF. They're not a government. They're not, they're just there to help facilitate uh, trade between different countries. And they run essentially by the major economies, the G20 nations, and particularly the G7 or 8, which is, you know, Russia, America, Great Britain, France, uh, Germany, and other countries. You're low again. So are you saying the only time the IMF comes into your country is if your financial situation is in trouble? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes, yes. I mean, they have other programs. They have other, you know, that encourages trade and, 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 and data exchange and other things. But in terms of to get on an IMF program, it's like, I mean, other than going to check up, I don't, I don't think you go to your doctor or you go to the hospital if you're not sick, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's what the IMF is, a clinic. For so over the years, sick. what has the IMF, uh, what, have been, what role have they played in, in Liberia? Oh, yeah, I think in the 80s, they, um, they helped with the, uh, the uh, Liberia government request their program. I think there was a time when the Ministry of, the, the same people at the Ministry of Finance. The, the 16 expert. Correct. To help help them manage their spends and and, and, and their, their, their their finances. So when they, when they put you on the program, then they give you what you call conditionalities. They will tell you, okay, we'll borrow you twenty million dollars, right? We'll put that in your reserve, so that you can import from other countries. You know, so those countries don't have a problem with you paying them back, and we'll charge you maybe five percent, which is the below market rate, or maybe sixteen percent. Uh, for that $20 million. 
but they will tell you you need to do certain things. You need to cut, uh, for instance, uh, civil servants' payroll. I'm just using that as an example. Or they might tell you you can't run a domestic uh, a deficit or any fiscal deficit. I'm sorry, not fiscal deficit, that means um, all the money that the government spends compared to how much taxes it is. Okay, so that's fiscal deficit. Um, so they will tell you, say, trade deficit is when the co a country uh, imports more than they export, so it creates a deficit. So for instance, China, they export more than they import from America. So China has a surplus. America has a deficit between China and America. So if you look at Liberia, we have a huge deficit. And every, that, for that deficit, we have to pay an interest. So as those things come into the country, um, somebody has to pay for it before those goods can come to, into Liberia. And so when your deficit is so high, like in the case of Liberia and many African countries, then the IMF can step in to ensure to give you some guarantee in order to facilitate that trade. But it comes with conditions. And, and mm. this is just it. And those conditions are very, very tough. Right. So, so what has been the impact? Is it are we been or following the advice or if, when we anytime we follow it, is it is it working for us or are we not following? What has been the the issue? Well, in the case of the Sanya Do administration, you saw the impact. I mean, his government collapsed, right? And you know, people died. At the end of the day, you know, if, if our economy collapses, there's chaos, there's war, there's all those things. So. In many countries, I mean, look at Somalia, you look at, you know, uh, Congo and all these other countries, they, they're not at war just because, in my opinion, they don't like each other, okay? I don't think they don't love their country or their fellow men. I don't think Liberians don't love each other or they love each other less than Americans love each other. The only difference in America, they have good policies that creates uh, more economic opportunities for more people. So when I hear people talk about we are looking for a president who loves his people, I don't know any man, everybody loves themselves and their family, okay? And I don't how, how do you measure how, how one person loves the country in, in, in relation to another person? Hmm. It's abstract, you can't. The only thing you can measure a country by are the economic and social statistics. How many babies are born, these four years old? I mean, the, the lifespan of, of a country, right. uh, the, the educational rate, the mortality uh, rate, the birth mortality rate. rate, birth rate, growth, uh, you know, housing. <laughs> you, you can only measure a country by those standards. Wait, 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 wait. I mean, we've, this, this has been a very key issue in Liberia. We want somebody who has, I mean, they, they love the way they say it, who has the country a heart. Right. I don't know, you can have it at foot sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Somebody who has the country a hat. Somebody who is, um, sometimes they say we need a Jerry Rollins type of leader. Okay. We need somebody who when you commit crime, boom, they shoot you dead. Okay. Or corruption, boom, they shoot you dead. You say none of those matter because we don't, we don't measure them. You can. If you can measure them, then show me. But how, you can. Something you can measure, you can quantify. You know, how do you, how do you even explain it? Yeah, having the country a hat. Somebody told me, say, Numbers are so important that even God devoted one book of the Bible called Numbers. No. Just numbers. <laughs> That's how important numbers is. So having the country a heart, we can't measure it. No, you can't. So let's throw out, out of the window. So we, we should talk about G GDP. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you will get George we have that. <laughs> Yeah, no, but you can't. But there are many statistics, and one of the best statistics, the one that I use and I like, is what you call the Human Development Index. Okay? Say so that louder. Your, when you your volume, we have to do something about it. Is it better? Or maybe oh. you need to talk loud. Just be shouting like you. I want to be shouting like I'm crazy. Yeah. Is it better. Okay. I, yeah. I, 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 all right. So one of the best statistics that I like to measure countries by is what you call the Human Development Index, right? HDI. Mm -hmm. Human Development Index, what does that mean? It's called, it, it means is they take uh, a bunch of things, like three major things, right? Life expectancy, education rate, and the, the income uh, of the country, the income per capita. And they created an equation, right? 
and that equation is a number from zero to one. And the higher you are on that scale, the better that country is in terms of social economic development. The lower you are on that scale, and I'm gonna put it up here so people can see it, right? Uh, The lower you are in that school. So that's a good measurement. If you want to measure Ghana in, in Nigeria, for instance. If you want to measure Ghana in Nigeria, for instance, I, I'm just trying to share this. Okay, there you go. That, okay, you can see, right? Yeah. So, SGI, Human Development Index, right? So they use the, the, the health of the country, the life expectancy from birth, right? It, there's an index, they take that number. They take their knowledge, which is the expected years of schooling, man versus woman, and what have they create a number, and then they are the, the, the GNI, right? The Gini index. And they measure that. You and are low it, again. Don't don't let me be complaining about the volume. Oh my god, I think you need to increase your studio thing. Okay. So this is a human development index. Okay. And every country in the world has a number. When our number is low, your country is on a, I don't even need to go to the country. You know, sometimes I hear people, when last you going to Liberia? I was just there two minutes ago. I look at the statistics. And that's how I know if the country is doing well. I look at the human development index. I look at the growth rate. I look at all these things. And I don't have to be there. I don't have to be in Afghanistan to understand what the people in Afghanistan are, you know, are doing or how they live their life. Okay, so basically, that's one way, and I will give you the, all the different countries, okay, like including Liberia. So if you go to the Human Development Index, these are all the countries. So what you see here is all the countries in green, right? The one with the, with the, the deep green. Yeah. Those are the countries with the highest. You see 90.90. And the ones in red, you got all the way to 0.29. Look at Liberia. So you see? This is basically can tell you anywhere in the world by just looking oh. at this here. Oh, I'm colorblind. I saw Liberia. I thought that was green. Okay, I think it's so it's red. Okay. So it tells you the bit the, the below 0.4 on the human, they're not even half. So when you when you this is something i can measure this is something that is proof when you tell me your president is good or a central bank president is good right i want to see if they can take us from what point 39 to at least point 50 in one to two three years if you can just get to point 75 right like you know like these countries here in in, in south america right Mm -hmm. Look at this country. Some you see 0.60 is yellow. Brazil and all these countries all the way to 0 0.75, 0 0.80. Okay, this all these countries were red two years ago, 20 years ago, two decades ago. Were red. All these countries here in Asia were red. South Korea, okay, Singapore were red. They're all now today, this country is what? Yellow and green. I can measure that. That's how I choose, you know, that's what I will choose somebody to say this person is a good president. I can care less, less if you love Liberia, you hate Liberia, you're good man, you're a bad man. But if you can turn Liberia to be maybe, you know, this color, you know, pink or whatever, and going to yellow, you you my guy. I don't care what guy you serve, I don't care what kind of you know who you like and who you don't like, how many girlfriends you have, how many white do you drink. Or you don't, I, I don't care about those things because this is the only thing that will measure how many kids go to school, your mortality rate of the uh, uh, of infants, this will your death rate. This is this is the statistics. Somebody already did this. The guy who did this, he won. He's an Indian an economist and and, and two Harvard. They came up with this, uh, and they came up with this uh, statistics. And I think he won a Nobel Prize. Hmm. So that yeah, that, that, that is, these are the two guys who did. Who did. So let's okay. go back. And this is the formula that we use, and every country has one. So if, so if we go here, see like Norway at the highest, Switzerland, Australia, Germany, 
That's why you see people, refugees, running to these countries. They're not running there because these countries are, you know, people love them more. What they're doing technically that they, know, that they don't think they're doing is they're running towards countries with higher HDI. That's all. You see United States here, 92. So let's go down. Estonia, these are small countries. And most of them have very high ranking. Okay. Hungary, Chile, 80, 84. So okay. then back to the IMF. So is the IMF trying to help us have a higher HDI or? No. The IMF is not there to grow your economy. The IMF, let me get, let me get girl I do so we can use this photo. So the IMF. If you uh, can find it, if you can find it, that tells the story. <laughs> I know it's, it's there. Uh, so the IMF is not there to essentially get you a high HDI score. So this is Africa right now. Okay. And this is we're going to Africa now. This side. You see, this shell, which is number one, this little small island, 100,000 or so people, and it has one of the highest uh, Mauritius. Then Botswana and Algeria. Then you go to South Africa, Ghana is 59. And so we can go all the way down. Nigeria is 53. So while measuring Ghana and Nigeria, Ghana is higher. Botswana is 62, closer to Nigeria. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire, 47. And we can go all the way down. Sierra Leone, 41. Liberia, 43. So we were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Seven, eight, nine, ten. We are the 10th lowest to the top, bottom low end of the HDI. Even Guinea besides. So Guinea is higher than us. Ethiopia is higher. Djibouti and Togo. So basically, this tells the story. But the IMF is not there to do that. Because again, mm -hmm. you know, this is a thing that just now looking at monetary policy. Again, what is the IMF? International Monetary Fund. The mm -hmm. only thing they're there for is money is to facilitate their help the central bank. They are not there to give their funding to build schools. They're not there to build hospitals. That's somebody else's job. Maybe the World Bank program or something. They're only there to... Uh, uh, Cyrus Freeman on Facebook said, the IMF is looking for business and always put their issue first and always push the matter to the table. So our government should please take time on discussing issue with them before we run into mess. He simply is saying the IMF is yet is there to get us, and it, they they, are, they look at themselves. They're not looking at you. It's what is benefit. The IMF? the IMF is a group of this all the country. You you are the IMF because that girl is part of the League of Nations, right? So the IMF is not a thing. It's not a. It, it's it's all the countries that get together and say, all right, um, this is how we're going to do business. If I borrow from Mr. Ja. I must pay him back. If I can't borrow, I can borrow from the other person. So the IMF is not a person or something. It's all the countries that get together. And guess what? Every country is looking out for themselves, including Liberia. So but, good but, point. But do these people have the best economies and best people that, because we listen to them, right? Is it because they are, they are the best brain and that's why they are advising us? Well, you can say they have some good economists and they've been doing it for a while. Um, in the area of their expertise, they, they have the best. So the area, if the IMF, if J.B. Morgan is looking for a chief financial officer, he's, they're not going to go to the IMF and to bring somebody there. They're looking for analysts to uh, analyze uh, derivatives or, or, or forex or you know trading. They're not going to go to the IMF. Or if you have on, the, on your resume, I worked for the IMF for 20 years, they're not going to hire you because that's not an area. But if, if you're looking to go to a country and uh, give them papers and proposals and study, like for instance, the former finance minister, right? I think he worked for the World Bank Group, right? Uh, Americana. So there's a reason he's not working at JB Morgan trading desk or something because his skills is not, he doesn't have those kinds of skills. They don't care whether you're president of a country or your finance minister. So IMF has a particular skill, and that is um, 
designing programs for poor countries to help their uh, to help them meet their trade uh, and fiscal uh, deficit. That's what we're good at in Wisconsin. Let, let me take a caller or hey. question. Caller, your name and where are you calling from? Yes, sir. Hey, Jai, you can hear me? This is Eastman. E Eastman. Jimmy Eastman. Eastman from, Jimmy Eastman from Washington, D.C. I can switch my headphones if you can't hear me clearly. It, I can hear you, but it could be better. It's not the best, but I can hear you. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Hold on. All right. Mr. Jimmy Eastman is our regular caller, and uh, we want to listen to what he, he, he said. Last thing right there. All right. So let's 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 move on to the, the overall financial state of the country. Mm -hmm. People tell you Alex have not been to Liberia, so he doesn't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. First, I show our guests why you think you can you you're able to be in Tampa, Florida, and assess the Liberian financial system. Well, because um the, the, the financial system of Liberia is a number, okay. okay? GDP is a number, growth is a number, uh, uh, HDI is a number, uh, the population is a number. And you can look at those numbers and analyze it. And that's what I do best. That's what I get paid to do. I get paid Good. to look at numbers and then uh, project Hello. not, only, not okay. only just analyze the numbers, but also what's going to happen, whether that number is going to say one quarter from now, three quarters from now, or 10 years from now. That's my area of expertise. Okay. That's what I do. Let, let me get Eastman on the call, then we can continue on the overall financial state. Mr. Eastman, you are live. Yeah, Dennis, how you hear? How, do you hear me clear or clearer now? Very, very, very well. Okay. So I, I enjoy, as usual, I enjoy your conversation and or your topics and and your guests. Uh, I mean, expounds well. I really appreciate these kind of intellectual forums, even though they may not be as popular as the gossip networks <laughs> and, the, and the and the slandering uh, networks of shows. But um, there's some treasure in these kind of programs. Um, I like your topic. Um, now, I, I, I must say in the beginning, uh, some may will ask, um, when I did study economics many, 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 many moons ago, we did not hold us, we held ourselves to a standard that if you're not currently studying economics, you are not an economist. So I am not an economist, okay? But the uh, IMF and the World Bank, they are not in there to... <laughs> Uh, as they say, so philanthropic reasons. Right. Those people are there to make money. They are a uh, investment arm of wealthy nations. We have to know that first. They're not philanthropic. They're not here. They're not there to uh, 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 help you per se for free. Hmm. Okay, as one does in philanthropy, but they're there to make some money out of whatever they do. Now, we really have to realize that the, uh, they, they don't have a, there's no one size fit all pro economic program for any nation. You will need to determine what is best for your nation, your culture, your people, your idealism, your faith, your beliefs, okay, your practices. You have to come up with something that works. Now, all they will do is finance it part of the way fully, but you have to come up with a program mm. for yourself. So they do suggest some generic things that work. For instance, streamlining your budget. That's, that's generic. Okay, you don't need to suffer people on the payroll, uh, especially if they're not productive. Of course, you want productive people. Mm. But there's a politics involved when you get rid of them. A lot of suggestions that the but, IMF and the World Bank mean? have made to develop the nations. Yeah. Do you need anybody to tell you that, yeah. that you need to reduce your payroll? 
Exactly. This is what I'm saying. Okay. Do you really need someone to tell you that? Mm. Exactly. Okay. But um, sometimes you do. And I, I think we better, we, I, from what I'm seeing, the level of understanding management today, uh, I think a lot of the managers today could go through some, a lot of good training and workforce development. Mm. Because as you all, as we all know, as we came up through our careers, a lot of, even if, if despite the degree, put the academics one side, please, yeah. but you need it on the job training. You need it to be schooled how to do the job best, real life situations. That's different than textbook. So those managers who just got in, coming on board or administrators or people in authority, they need, they need some coaching. So I, I can't take for granted that they didn't know that they shouldn't have put all those people on the payroll. Now, there maybe have been political reasons for doing it, but in the long run, you suffer. So now you have a whole lot, a whole lot of people. They're not very productive. The best thing to should have done, you should have put them in where they could be productive, not simply, you know, appeasing them by putting them in where they would not even do anything. That's, that doesn't solve the problem. It kicks the can down the road, you know? So the IMF is coming. Okay, okay. You, apparently, you guys, you need some help. Well, well, we see these things. Mm. Okay, and if you're not able to figure it out out yourself, well, they tell you what to do. And if you want their money, then you have to do what they said tell you to do. Yeah. So, so the World Bank, the uh, you know the IMF, they are good organs to get money. Again, do we want to really be borrowing? What kind of borrow money do we want to borrow? We want to borrow money that will lead to growth because that's the number one thing that's given our economy a hard time. There are no jobs. There are no jobs because there's no industry developing. That's the number one problem we have right now. Okay? Legal read, there are legal magnifications. There's all those things. But believe me, if the economy was flourishing, we would have less regard for all those other things. Exactly. We definitely need the economy, the economy flourishing. But how can we get the economy moving? Now, IMF comes in and they build a factory or they build a, a industry. Oh, yeah, I'm all for that. But if they're coming in to pay payroll, pass, pass, pass up wage bills, that doesn't help. It, it just puts you further in the hole. Yeah. Okay? So we have to have a plan, you know, a workable plan to uh, emerge ourselves from this cycle of poverty and, and disease and, uh, and uh, all that sort of thing. Now, we do, I think there is one in place, uh, it's the pro-poor agenda, but um, did it, how well did it address growth in the economy? Yeah. Because, and that, and, and that is the thing, you have to know what you want to address immediately. What is immediate? Roads are excellent, a uh, 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 facilitation for growth, but you still have to grow. So what what are you doing to address growth in the country? Mm. And one number one thing you could do, you could sh make commerce as fluid as possible by not impeding any business at all because you need businesses to thrive. But when you are uh, trying to get revenue by squeezing businesses at a time when you need economic growth in your country, you see, you kind of like spite your nose to save your face. You need to grow the economy. That has to be paramount. And if you're doing things, taking measures, uh, employing uh, uh, policies that will, will strangle and, and thwart businesses, then you're, 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 you got to revisit it. You have to revisit it. So the IMF is not going to, they may suggest things, they may take a look at it and yeah. suggest it. But again, you have to have a plan. That, that okay? Is, that is correct. Just like you go into, you, you tell about somebody you want to build a house. You go to somebody, I want to build a house. Okay, the guy is going to ask you, what kind of house you want to build? If you don't know what kind of house you want to build, what are you going to build you in that kind of house? Yeah. See, you say you wanted a house. Yeah. So you have to know what you want. That, and that you, you know, and that's, and that's, and that's my input. Thank you know, you. Say, if you don't know, if you don't know where you're going, then <laughs> you don't even have to worry. Exactly. About it. Exactly. Maybe you arrive already. You know, right. Thank you so much, Jimmy, as usual, for yeah. your contribution. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to take this time to welcome our West African correspondent, Mr. Edward Amara. Mr. Amara, in my hand is a piece of cola nut. I'll say welcome with this cola nut that we can symbolically break together. Thank welcome. you very much. Thank you very much. As normally, I think I did think so apart. They said he who brings like uh, bring cola, bring like. Thank you very much, and mm -hmm. I hope we share the cola note also. Uh, not, I would not be sharing any cola note today. <laughs> right. Wow, 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 Alex, why? <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe in cola note. I believe in you a rate of return. <laughs> I know you're an economist, and normally you believe in the flow of cash. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. Anyway, yeah, because you don't, you don't know everyone. the meaning of cola nut, but I will explain yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please do. I think I think I think cola nut of different African uh, African way of interpreting it's it's a way to bring bond between people. It's a sign of peace love and it will serve as a gift at home so learn to accept cola not always yeah. well, right. no he said he doesn't care about love he doesn't care about anything he just the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> that, that's interesting anyway that's Dude, interesting. So mad, <laughs> right, you know, yeah, uh, mr mr amara welcome to the business economic forum we've been discussing current economic issues and uh, I just want to get your, your, your input. You are right there in uh, Freetown. You know, Labrador and Sierra Leone is like, you don't have to go to the other country to know what's going on there. <laughs> they are so similar. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, perfectly right. Mm -hmm. and, and so just give you a quick view and then we go to our news roundup from Mama Africa. Yeah, I think I learned about how I uh, think Liberia before this time is it is the three the, the, the third governance in, in 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 a year or two years that's really really bad. Uh, I think what normally happens with African states like Liberia Sierra Leone is no exception is that normally when we have political uh, polit different political parties taking over the economy of the country because each time one political party takes over the leadership of one country you expect that the the first thing that they target is the economy. Unfortunately, the, most of the people that they appoint to manage the economy of the country not, should be political sympathizers or people who actually sympathize with the ideology of that part, particular political party. They do not actually observe as the expertism area. And that is the wrong thing. Because Liberia is a third world country just in the form of, of, like, of Sierra Leone. So if you really want your country to develop in the economic standard of that country to rise from its current status, what they need to do is to appoint uh, experts who have that training in the economy, who have financial training, because they should be the only people that have to advise the president on how they should manage the economy of the country. But that is not actually observed in typical African context. The similar thing is in the Sierra Leone, similar thing in Liberia. So they appoint people who actually sympathize with the political party ideology and they overlook the expertise. And normally you see the, the country GDP will drop, and also everything will drop. I think it's high time they forget about such things. And normally IMF also wants advice Sierra Leone and the same thing they also, they should also involve in advising Liberia because you see the economy of West African countries is normally do not dream in the economy. And IMS is investing a lot into the economy of this country. So what they normally do, they ask, advise the government on what to do and what not to do. They can even ask you not to subsidize this or you should drop this. If you fail, they have to withdraw their support. So the best thing that the open way led government should start doing now is to actually look for experts. I mean, it's really, there are a lot of complaints against the, the current finance, uh, finance minister, Jacob Jizu Safa. They may say that he is... He, he is just a kind of brother of, of the, the current president. And if certain things should be done, they need somebody who is neutral, somebody who's an economic expert to actually tap the economy of, like the, of, of Sierra Leone. So the we are led government is also facing certain challenges. And we all know the saga that have been going on before this time. And as long as there is no stability in the economy, I doubt how the common man over there will survive. So that is my opinion. So coming down towards the uh, development in Africa, let us start in the eastern part of Africa. In Tanzania, Tanzania is a country that is located in the Horn of Africa, in the eastern part of Africa. They normally have people who live there with albinism. And albinism 
or albinos, they are normally called, is a type of genetic disorder. Unfortunately, for that part of the world, they normally attack these people. They use them as a form of ritual contact. And when it is time of politics, they use most of those albinos to get rich, uh, what, our spiritual power, and they believe that such thing like that, we, we, what, we give them fortune in time of election. So what they normally do, they attack these people, they kill them, and they have found themselves into certain communities. So about 65 witch doctors, we are convicted today in court, and some of them we are actually sent in life imprisonment because the, we are found guilty in killing 10 of these abusers. That was the allegation, but the police are saying that they are yet to prove that all the children who we are killed actually we are abusers. But in Tanzania, Burundi, even coming towards uh, Rwanda, we normally face attack of people like that. Each time somebody with the abinic or genetic disorder in the form of abinu, they are normally attacked. Then in South Africa, Nancy Mandela, who we all know was an icon of Africa, to me, I normally don't cherish him a lot because uh, justice cannot be what, what when you talk about reconciliation when it, if ever reconciliation should come into any country we must have what we call uh, justice but unfortunately justice was not delivered just after the apartheid regime in south africa and nancy mandela took over the running of the country what he did he tried to uh, pacify the country by forgiving the white at the detriment of the black and up to now, this black are still complaining. So his statue was revealed in Havana, that is the capital city of Cuba, and it is in part of South, uh, South America, and they're actually using that statue as a type of a, what, a monument for most of the time African leaders to go and pay homage. And uh, uh, he, he, the late president, Nancy Mandela, was actually a sympathizer of Fidel Castro and Ro Castro. These are the brothers who took, who took made the revolution. And he was also, they were also revolutionaries who actually succeeded in ensuring that Cuba become a free independent state from the yoke of other colonizers like America. Then we come back into the central part of Africa, where I'll have Cameroon. Cameroon is actually facing problem with the English-speaking Cameroonian, that is the Anglophone and the Francophone Cameroon. It's a serious talk to see those people. And the, the 87 years old president, who is Paul Bea, he still wants to contest for the presidential election. But the opposition leaders in Cameroon actually do not trust the, the, what, the, the election, and they are calling on UN for UN to, for UN to intervene into the election so that... Um, Peace and tranquility will reign. They do not believe into how uh, that election will be conducted into a free and fair atmosphere, claiming that they want independent and they want to vote for a separate state. So they are asking the U.S. to intervene. In Africa also, election will be held there by the year 2020. The opposition leaders are actually, and the opposition leader, including the government, are actually calling for U.N. to strongly intervene. We all know Africa just sit by Mali, uh, by, by Africa just sit a little bit with Liberia and close to Burkina Faso and share borders with other West African states, including Guinea. But we have been seen on numerous occasions uh, what I see, that is the Islamic state of Iraq, have actually been supporting troops to come and attack Burkina Faso. So Africa is definitely not safe. So they are asking the UN to send some peacekeepers over there whenever elections are to be held because they do not actually believe in the fate of the current security forces they are afraid. Then coming in, in Central Africa, Kenya and, and Somalia want to solidify their peace because Kenya actually got heavily involved into the Somalian politics because of Ashabab that is actually existing into the country. And they want to ensure that they have a solid security forces along that Mogadishu as it, so that at least let there be peace and tranquility really over there. Because normally these places come under attack by Shabab. And uh, Africa also, that is where I'm going to conclude my story. We, we all know one, or if you're a soccer fan, you must know about Didier Drogba, who is a soccer legend. He, he was actually offered an opportunity to come and work with, uh, with the Chelsea current manager, Frank James Lampard, who is currently leading Chelsea team. But he turned down that particular opportunity to ensure that he head back to Africa and take over the, 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 the presidency of the football association in Africa. Because the election had to be held in 2020. But because Drogba is an icon in Africa, and he played a pivotal role to ensure that Africa get the peace and tranquility that they're enjoying today. So he decided to turn down it and actually hope on the country football association to vote for him in order for him to become the president of Africa. And finally, as I said, the last but not the least in Guinea, today Amnesty International put out a statement claiming that uh, 
the security forces of Guinea are behaving in discipline, in into a kind of indisciplinary way, and they are killing civilians. Yesterday, a teenager or a teen boy was killed in the in the demonstration. Now, everybody who has been killed, they are saying they are taking every kind of uh, incident that is going on into Guinea, they are taking into account. At the end of the day, these people are going to face the book for whatever crime they are committing. And the CDA, CD dialogue today, who is the opposition leader, actually made that complaint for her. And pretty soon, we'll be having ECOWAS and other UN staff, including AU, to investigate some of this crime incident into Guinea. Thank you. You see, uh, Mr. Amara, I really, really, yeah. we had focused on Labra, really, really appreciate you. Uh, when I was in Liberia and also as a refugee in Guinea, Ghana, Nigeria, and Africa, Coast, I listened to every BBC broadcast focused on Africa, Network Africa, VOA, every day. But since a couple of years after coming to America, I don't listen to that anymore. So I look forward to your reporting. And it reminds me of those days when I was an ardent listener to this, uh, to this broadcast. Really, really appreciate you. And you give us the hope that uh, there are good people in, 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 uh, in Africa. And there are people that are very well versed, very learned, and very talented, and can get the job done. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I also appreciate you very much for having connected me to this type of international forum. I will never stop enjoying the peace and happiness that I normally take each time I involve into the program. That is why sometimes when I try and the network fails to go through, only God knows how <laughs> I sleep. Thank you. Thank you. And when we were discussing electricity yeah. and uh, and your light went off, that was, <laughs> what that was a, a, a test well, case. Well, that the issue we're talking about and still we, we are still talking about it, and we know that uh, in spite of the uh, sometimes the harsh conditions, you are committed, and you put a lot of time and effort in this work. We can't thank you enough. Thank you very very much. It was a, it was a coincidence that time, and it just and that was good. We are discussing something. That was <laughs> it good. was actually good. So it just gave a clear picture evidence of what <laughs> we are discussing. <laughs> and I wonder, Alex, you know that uh, the man who has just been appointed as the uh, as the new bank governor of Liberia, I think he was somehow uh, connected with Liberia Electricity. So I don't know you how, you're going to compare, <laughs> how you're going to compare somebody who has been working with electricity to the economy. <laughs> I hope you will not make the Liberia dollars to catch fire. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you man. thank you my brother yeah, oh yeah. man that's a good analogy right yeah. and so yeah. alice before i uh bring you back in we have a caller on the line okay um caller your name and where you calling from my name is patrick soa and i call you from uh, south dakota Patrick, welcome to Focus on Liberia. You know, uh, you're one of those who call regularly. Yeah. Your question or comment? Um, first, I want to say thank you to Alex. I mean, he, he's a good guy. I'm just going to add up to what he said. I'm not a student of economics. I, my interest in economics is not too huge. What he said is right. You talk about the role of IMF in Liberia. IMF oversees Liberia's monetary can adjust, system. Can you adjust your phone a little yeah. bit? You're, 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 we're kind of losing you. You getting me now? Okay, yeah. Yeah, like I said, I mean, I'm just going to board for what he said. Uh, you talk about the role of IMF in Liberia. IMF oversees Liberia's monitor uh, system and monitors the financial and economic policies. It is a fact of uh, economic development in Liberia and also provide macroeconomic and financial policy advice to our country. But I have a, a view that in most cases, we as a country, our policy, uh, people don't listen to most of the advices, the piece of advices, again. And I will back it up with uh, 
uh, with two incidents quick. One, uh, in 1975, there was a, there was a prolonged uh, strike by LMC, the Liberal Mining Company. There was a prolonged strike by the employee. Now, at that time, I met him with a warning to our policy makers that, hey, uh, it, is, it is believed that, policy makers believe that Liberia's uh, export, major export, the rubber, the timber, the cocoa, will sustain Liberia's uh, economy on the global stage. But they said, no, there will come a time there will be a fall. You know, there will be a reduce in the a drop in the price of iron ore on the world market. So at that time, it was there was a warning that we should try to open up the economy. We should try to diversify the economy. But, I mean, they didn't listen to that. Again, in uh, on April the 8th, 2016, Abibo Amino Silasi is the deputy director of IMF African Development. It covers for the five. It covers the for the five countries. On April the 8th, 2016, just go online, just Google his name. IMF through that guy, they brought out four major steps that we can take to revitalize our economy. Four simple. They are not following that. Mm. They are calling uh, economic, how you call it, group for loans in Liberia. They say, so in most cases, we don't, we don't read it in my mind. We don't listen. To but, but, why, why, why you think is, we Patrick, why, why you think is that? Uh, why you think we don't listen because we don't, we don't believe them? Our policy makers, you know, the movers, and shake out of our economy, of our country. I don't know. I'm not going to speak for them because if they were listening, especially in 1975, if they were to listen to IMF, open the, 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 the economy, try to diversify the economy, the little money they had in their reserves, but instead, they didn't listen. And now they're not listening. I don't know what is the reason, but we don't in most cases listen to them. And let me just conclude with this central bank issue. Um... At the center of the governor, I mean, I think we just need to give him a time, a chance to work. Many people have had problems with him because he does not have a degree in, a, uh, in finance, in accounting, or uh, in economics. But I very respectfully disagree with people like that. On grounds that uh, the 1999 Act of the Central Bank of Liberia, and, get, and this is my question to the, to the, to the guests. Um, 1999, out of the Central Bank of Liberia, uh, Section 10, Chapter 5 and 6, uh, Part 4, it mm -hmm. says that the central, the executive governor of the Central Bank of Liberia shall be appointed by the president. And listen to this phrase. Listen, listen to this part shall be appointed by the president and shall have long-standing experience in finance and economic matters. Now, with the 17 years experience that I read that this central bank governor, the appointed governor is coming on board with, in my mind, I think he has the long-standing experience in economics and finance, but for your pseudo guest who is uh, from that terrain, what is the economic interpretation of having a long standing experience in finance and economic matters? Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, so that's a very, that's a very good point. And again, um, like I said, uh, I don't judge people based on degrees or even long-standing background that can mean nothing i mean somebody someone can have a 30-year experience in technology and somebody can have a two-year experience and do a better job so you know that's very relative the only thing i'm concerned about is like it would have been good if 
there was some publication. And part of the reason people, you say long standing um, background, it, it, what have you done yeah. during those years? And, mm -hmm. and how can someone evaluate it? Right. Looking at a resume and seeing you work at JP Morgan, what did you do at JP Morgan? Right. And, and how does that apply to the current job you'll be doing? To, and that's and, why I said the communication will be very important. And, and Alex, I, I kind of I sometimes, you know, mentor or coach people, you know, looking for a job and writing their resume. So one of the things I tell them is uh, because when it comes to experience, what we always do is to list mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, our job responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That's not what the employer is looking for. Mm -hmm. The employer is looking for what you actually did. Right. So if you were, uh, um, if you were being hired to maybe paint, tell us that, okay, the Empire State Building, I the one painter it. Right there, you, they'll pick you up. But if you say, in my previous job, my responsibility was to paint. My responsibility was to, you know, iron clothes. It doesn't tell much of your achievement. So what is it that you have done that we can look at and say? So I, as I too, I see the resume of uh, Mr. Talu and it says he worked in uh, compliance. Okay, so what I want to see is actually what did you accomplish? Even as a compliance officer, because there are a lot of uh, uh, skills and experience that can translate to something else. Okay, if you were in class and you were writing down the names of noise makers and you said, because this is your, you are just coming out of elementary school. That's compliance. <laughs> right. <laughs> That is compliance. Maybe that can translate into compliance. That can translate into a payroll experience. So list for us what we actually did instead of just saying, oh, I was class prefect. But let's go to the overall financial state of, of the country. And uh, what we were discussing earlier was uh, how you all the way in America know this and how do you assess the current financial state of the country? And I think we can conclude with that. Well, um, again, and, and, and I would just do this real quick. Um, maybe it will help uh, to close things up here. Uh, I think the way I look at Liberia is, again, like a patient. You have to find out what is wrong with it for the patient. I'm not a doctor or a health professional, but just from a, practical, from a practical standpoint, you have to look at Liberia as a patient, an economic patient is sick. And all the numbers suggest that. Um, how then the next thing is, uh, what is the solution? No, no, somebody, you, you said all the numbers suggest that. Which numbers? All, all the international numbers that I can uh, point to those here their GDP, their growth rate, their income per capita is the lowest in the, one of the lowest in the world. Uh, the human development index is one of the lowest. The, the, the uh, number of people employed, the living stand. I mean, I don't, I don't know any statistic. I, the only one statistic that I think that works for Liberia, and that is the, the debt to GDP is very low. Mm -hmm. That's the only good number Liberia has. And that's the best number. If, you know, if I was advising the government, um, what that number says is you have low debt mm -hmm. compared to your GDP. So in a country like Japan, we have a 200% of GDP, and that number is a percentage. In this but, but case, how is that number good? You, you have low debt because you're living with your father who's giving you things free. <laughs> yeah, so now you can go out and borrow. Mm -hmm. And so let me let me just point to, uh, so these are all the statistics on Liberia. So let's start from the top, right? And okay. the, growth, the growth rate now is point, uh, I think 4%. So this was in 2018, right? Uh, unemployment rate, we don't count that because every in every country project their own uh, uh, unemployment rate, and we know that Liberia does not have a 2.4 unemployment rate. The inflation rate is 29.9% as of July 2019. The interest rate is what, 12%. You're talking about interest rate, competing with interest rate, 4%, 5% in, in, in some parts of Africa, 6% reasonable, 12% is too high. The trade balance, right? Debt, which is a deficit, this is a monthly figure. 41 million every month you're accumulating from trade. That's how much you owe. This is some of the things that IMF uh, help uh, money will help facilitate. Right? Explain, explain that again. What does that mean, trade balance? Okay, I think, I think we did have a whole class. But uh, basically, when you buy every country, right, 
when a loan man goes to, the, to go purchase a building material, he goes to the central bank. The company is in China, right? They send mm -hmm. a building material to Liberia. Let's say it's $1 million, right? Liberia uses Liberian dollar or US dollar. China uses the remedy or the yen, right? All right. What happens is Liberia now don't have the enough money to pay for that. Or they have the money, but there's more things that are coming from China going to Liberia in terms of value, monetary value, than from Liberia going to China. Okay, so this is a composition of all the all the trade that we have with all the other countries okay. in relations to us. Okay. And in a dollar figure, every month is forty one million dollars negative. Okay, so we have to pay for that. Uh, your your current account, one hundred seventy one million dollars. Very similar uh, in terms of trade trade account uh, concept. All right, your GDP. Uh, your current account to GDP, 15 million, same concept here. Yeah. But this is the number that I like, debt to GDP. Okay. Uh, it's only uh, uh, 32%. That is very low. Okay. Government budget to GDP, 4%. That's okay. So let's go to the debt to GDP and why I think this number is very low. The annual number. Let's look at other countries. So you see at one point here, yeah. <clears throat> Our debt to GDP was what? 172, right, percent. And it's come down to 32%, and now we stay at 32%. That's pretty good. That's what I think. That means even if we borrow, if we have the ability to borrow, let's say, a billion dollars, okay, uh, our debt, debt to GDP will still be, what, 60% or 70%. That's still low. If you look at other countries' debt to GDP, uh, you'll find that in the what hundred percent. There you go. The best number. Right? America one hundred six. Right, one hundred six. Right. So you look at Italy. So these are all, and this is bad. When you see America, basically is bankrupt. That what you mean? The debt to GDP. You go Brazil, what seventy six percent? Right. All these countries fifty. So that's a great number. And guess what? That's a central bank number. That number, if the central bank knows what they're doing, they can, they can, they can explore that number. They can use that number now to grow their economy and get reasonable. Yeah, yeah but, but still people won't lend us money, even though our debt to GDP is, is good, but they won't still lend out money because of our GDP. No, the GDP is low. We have one of the lowest GDP in the world too. And we have a low GDP, GDP. So those are two good indicators. So why would it? Now, the question or the reason why we are borrowing, where are we borrowing from? We're borrowing money, you know, through concession loans, right? Or through International Monetary Fund or IMF. But that's those are not only the source of, 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 of borrowing. There's different kinds of loans. Uh, there are private commercial loans. So if we have Liberian Corporation, which is one of the things that I promote, those corporations don't carry Liberian debt. They don't carry Liberian liability, right? And those corporations can borrow to grow things like minerals. You can have a mineral corporation in Liberia that can grow. Uh, you can have uh, fishing, mining, all these different things. So again, it's, it's an art. You have to understand how to you know, play the numbers to your, to your side. And that's what Liberians have not done our financial people. Uh, again, Mr. Eastman touched on it. You said bring expert. Well, we're the Liberian financial expert that I, please tell me, because I've been looking for them and I can't find many of them. I mean, like you said, somebody working in compliance doesn't make you a financial expert. You may be a compliance expert. That's good. Maybe be the head of uh, the, the, what you call the watchdog on terms of corruption, right? That's a good position for that person because they know how to see if all the ministries are complying with the laws or not. But a financial expert should be someone who knows nothing but numbers, who can look at each of these numbers and can tell you, can tell a story, and then you can create uh, the kind of... Uh, so, so because of these numbers, our financial situation, you say, is not really good, but we have, there's a prospect because of our debt to GDP ratio. Okay. 
So let's say you have 10 numbers. You take your force, you take your heart rate, you take all these numbers and they find out all are bad. But, you know, they check your, your high blood pressure, your high blood cholesterol. pressure is good. <laughs> cholesterol is pretty good. And the doctor say, well, that's good. That's one good sign. Now the key is to bring all these numbers down. So unemployment uh, uh, rate, you want to bring it to the actual number where it should be. The problem here, we haven't even, you know, even I think the last number came what December 2017, right? Uh, yeah. So we want to bring the interest rate number to maybe, I would say, I mean, inflation rate number, we want to bring that down to maybe 8, 8%. If we can bring inflation to 8%, if we can bring interest rate to, let's say, 10 because the rationale is a high interest rate will fight inflation, which is what Twelve was talking about. But in our case, you know, we have our, our interest rate is still too high. So if we carry the interest rate or higher, it will slow down the economy. So how can you bring, reduce the interest rate, mm. reduce inflation, right, without affecting growth? Yeah. Our growth rate is too low. Where our growth rate, what? Less than 1%. If you bring your interest rate higher, you take taking interest rate higher, you, 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 even, you go to negative. So again, mm -hmm. it's an art. And what my recommendation has been, and I'll hopefully conclude on that, is this. Uh, I think I, well, I wrote this paper in July, and I said one thing. So in July, I was talking about the IMF when nobody was talking about the IMF. And I said, yeah, I do not believe the IMF, the U.S., or the World Bank is capable of helping like do at this point. In my opinion, they have helped cause the problem. Right? which stands back decades, beginning with the Washington Consensus Plan. I sincerely believe that only Liberians can save Liberia. And what I recommend that you I said, uh, the, the president, I mean, the president has the power to institute an independent emergency economic management team, comprising about 50 Liberians with fully financial and economic expertise to study, review, and present a sound economic roadmap Humanity. That's my prescription. That's yet to happen. So let, let, let me let me before I let you go, let me conclude on, on this one too. Uh, the news that is coming to like from Liberia is um prices uh because of the salary harmonization, they have slashed salary, some areas that people that talk to me by 55%. Okay. So people that were making uh, uh hundred dollars, they are making less than fifty dollars now. Okay, and uh Exchange rate is up. According to what I heard from people we send money to, they are requiring you to uh, open a bank account and even deposit 25% of that money in that account. So that they can, it's like uh, right now, if that story is true, it's like we are now robbing Peter to pay Paul. Okay, let me, let me put it this way. And again, on the record here, let's say the government decide they would Every money that is sent to Liberia, they will take 100% and pay the people in Liberia back. It will not solve the problem. Let's say if we reduce everybody pay by 50% in Liberia, it will not solve the problem. So that tells you, uh, because the root of the problem is not cost spending or just currency exchange. The root of the problem is the lack of indigenous growth. And only one way you can grow it called the economy. You grow it by creating institutions in the country that is producing something. So you can cut wages. No, no, say, say that again. I almost lost you. What is the way to grow the economy, you said? The only way you can grow the economy is by the manufacturing capacity of the country, your export. The, the activity. Now, you can have artificial growth where maybe America gave you $10 million, or you have the unit made troops in Liberia, like in the case of uh, the previous years. But that's not real growth. That, that's not indigenous growth. The way you can grow is it can be sustained, which is what I'm saying. To have a sustained growth in the country, you must have manufacturers that are producing something. And that, that thing is generating jobs and spending. So you can call wages. So basically, like you said, couldn't, you know, it's like a slow death. Liberia is a slow economic death. I mean, there's no way, because the things they're doing are not, it's like somebody has cancer, you're giving them Tylenol. Okay? You have to come, you got to get, get a chemotherapy or something, you know, that mm -hmm. is going to kill the cancer. 
not giving us something that's going to say, oh, the, uh, the, the person headache. It's not a noise for headache. So that's the problem with the Liberian economic uh, management mm -hmm. team today. They, they, first of all, they haven't really studied the problem. Two, they don't have the right financial and economic team on the ground that independent now, not somebody who's going to be like, oh, tell us what we want to do. So all the things they've tried, harmonization of, of uh, uh, salary, what are, what's that going to do? If you have $10, right? And one person is taking the whole $10 and you decide to take the whole $10 and divide it by 10 people, you still have $10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was trying to- uh, Not make any sense. <laughs> I was trying to explain uh, the 55% reduction. So my example was if you're making $100, because you have 55% reduction, you're going to be making less than $50. Joseph, where you said no one is making below $100, US, my friend. So just for the record, that's not what I said. I was just giving an example of 55% reduction. Also, Joseph, where you were saying balance of payment is also important, but Liberia only consumes and can produce anything. And that's the problem. Why? Because all our industries, or and I think we'll do a show soon, just about the Liberian Corporation, the Liberian uh, semi-autonomous corporations, FPRC, uh, the Port Authorities, Telecommunications. These are engines of growth. These are the companies in Liberia that are supposed to be growing their revenue every year by 10, 15, 20 percent. That's how you expand the economy. But guess what happened when you look at the balance sheet today? If they have one, you find out that they're losing money every quarter. You find mm -hmm. out that they're not growing. So how, how where is that growth is going to come from? Is the million dollar question? Maybe mm -hmm. the cola no get passed, and somehow we get it, but it, it, it's not there. This clearly showed that this is our area. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's our area, right? So yep. uh, really, I, I want to thank you so much mm -hmm. for, for, the, for the time. I just want to play that music again so that people know that uh, business and economic is our era. <laughs> Here's my man, Ellis Juju Jones. <laughs> Finance, that your area. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> We need to jump. <laughs> and we are looking for, for, for people to join, to join the business and economic forum. You may have area, your area could be in a, as a broker or as an accountant. We welcome you on board. Uh, Alex, let's uh, conclude your final thoughts and also what you expect, what's the feedback you're expecting from our people, both people in government, policy makers, ordinary Liberians, how do you want them to respond to the business and economic forum? Conclude on that as your final well, thought. I, th I think they should, they should take it seriously because that's the only kind of think tank you have where you have people come on specifically to discuss finance and economics. We, I, we don't come on here to pay patronage to any government or any official. What I say here, I would say to the same Eddie Johnson Salud government or any other government in Liberia. If Dennis Dye, you president tomorrow, the business economic forum will also scrutinize your policy and will also tell you when you're going to hit a brick wall, uh, as being the case. So, you know, unfortunately, this is not a place to get solace or comfort. You come here for reality and the way Liberian economy looks right now, it will collapse unless you create a team of emergency financial experts to start working like yesterday. So if you are watching our show and your area is to cost, please leave that show and come and watch the Business and Economic Forum. Thank you so much, Alex. And on behalf of all of us at the Focus on Liberia, we want to say thank to all our viewers for watching and for taking part. For those who are commented on Facebook, we say thank you so much. Keep the comments going and uh, call us, drop us a line. Let's see uh, what your views are. And if you have any topic you want us to discuss, you can still let us know. We don't have all the ideas. It is from all of you that we're trying to build this uh, institution. So please uh, keep your comments coming. We also have our YouTube. Right after the show, you're going to see this video on YouTube. Share it 
subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have um, a little over 800 subscribers. We want to, our goal before this year end is to push that up to at least 1,500. So share the video, let all your friends uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click on that little bell has the notification so that anytime we put up a video up there, you get notified and you can watch it. All this is gonna benefit our country. Uh, we put a lot of time in this and we want our country to move forward from where it is right now. Liberia is the only country we have. And uh, whether we are dual citizen, unit citizen, triple citizen, let's do our best to where our neighbor stream was buried so that our country, that sweet land of liberty can live to its true meaning. When uh, Liberia was established, it was established to give refuge to all the oppressed people around the world. In fact, the early Liberians, people that came to Liberia, they ran away from either war or pestilence, being the, the, uh, the Kua, the Kua, the Mel, the Mende, the Mandingo, all ran from something. So Liberia is that country of refuge. And you can't go seek refuge and be hungry. So the only way is for us to beef up our economy. We have the cooperation that uh, Alex talked about so that we can grow our GDP, so our human development index can be high, so we can meet <laughs> <I> uh, <laughs> Something I just remember that uh, I did economics. Oh now yeah, you, you I did. <laughs> So thank you, you guys. Good job, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's our goal here. Let's improve our economy. And we don't have to worry about president. We don't have to worry about legislature making laws. We don't even have to worry about who has the country at heart or who has it at foot or who has it at stomach. All we want to do is uh, like, be a thriving economy and all of us will go back. The nine to five job giving you a hard time now, man. So we need to yep. go back. Create our own companies. Right now, I'm involved in uh, setting up a model school in Liberia. That uh, elementary school, we want to give our people that foundation so that the same way my son in the second grade is able to read at a seventh grade level, he's not better than people that are in Liberia. But with the right opportunity, the right resources, they can do the same. That's and, the right our goal. and the right investment. Yeah, you always talk about the money. The right investment. <laughs> that, is, that is correct. So thank you again. Thank you. To all our listeners, we say, have a good night. <laughs> because I have my era, man, and I'm not willing to share it. Good night, Alex. All right, good night, Dennis. Bye. Good night. Good night.